often when business slows down, the first line of defense is I'll just cut my fees. Really at a time when you're going to have fewer customers, you're going to cut your fees and make even less money. Episode 83. This is The Business of Architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architect Nation. I am your host, Enoch Bartlett Sears. And this is the show where we share tips and strategies for running a fulfilling, flexible, and profitable architecture practice. As successful architect developer Jonathan Siegel says about the golden rule, he who has the gold makes the rules. Now, I make no excuses for wanting to help you make more money because I truly feel that with that fat wallet in your back pocket, you'll be empowered to shape the world through design the way that you want to shape it, the way that you started out, you know, those dreams you had in design school, architecture school, bring those to fruition with a flexible, fun, and fulfilling practice. I want to thank quickly those of you who joined us for the Business of Architecture Summit last month. We got some amazing feedback. And here's just a quick quote from Seattle architect Kerry Westerbeck I want to share with you. He says, After attending every presentation of the Business of Architecture Summit the last two days, I can honestly say that I'm brimming with so much useful new information, I need to take stock and figure out what to implement first. Each topic was so informative and on point for where I'm at in my practice that I felt an urgency to go apply the principles immediately. The presenters have been absolutely top shelf and are masters on their topics. They've shared hard-won industry information that would have taken me a lifetime to learn on my own. I can already see that attending the Business of Architecture Summit will be one of the most important things I do for my practice this year, if not this decade. (laughs) Thank you very much, Carrie, for that. And I want to encourage those of you who are listening out there, whether you're planning on starting up your firm in the future or whether you currently have a firm, The sessions that were presented at the Business of Architecture Summit are essential. Um, We had a lot of architects on there who had younger firms, and then we also had a lot of architects who were more experienced and have been doing this for a long time. And each one of them said that it was just fabulous and they got a lot out of it. So I encourage you to head on over. It's a very uh, minimal investment for you to get some of the most cutting-edge business information for your firm. You can pick up the recorded sessions at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash summit. So that's businessofarchitecture.com forward slash summit. Now, last week we spoke with Kimberly Selden. Kimberly Selden is the leader of an award-winning interior design build firm uh, studio with offices in both Toronto and Los Angeles. I brought her on because she runs the the organization, the business of design, which is very similar to the business of architecture, except it's tailored towards interior decorators, designers, and stagers. Now, In addition to running a successful design build firm, Kimberly is also a very successful uh, businesswoman and thought leader. And last week, she shared the lessons that she's learned about running a successful business. So today, we continue our conversation and talk a little bit more about what it means to run a successful business in the field of design. Today's show is underwritten with generous support from BQE Software, the developers of Archie Office. For over 10 years, architects have relied on Archie Office to power their office and empower themselves. Go check it out at archeoffice.com. So when did you first, what came first? Did you first start getting into TV? When did you move into the publishing and broadcast sphere? So when I was living in Los Angeles, I worked at ABC uh, behind the scenes in production. And then I moved to Toronto and uh, ended up in television again. Got kind of sick of the television world, decided to go to interior design school. And then when I graduated, um, I don't, I got really lucky and somebody just asked me if I would be a guest on a TV show. And, um, it was easy and it was fun. So that all happened and that was wonderful. Uh, and then simultaneously I'm trying to grow my design business. So here I have the status of expert in the public eye. I have my phone ringing off the cl- hook, lots of clients, but I'm failing really miserably on delivering them a final perfect completed project. Um, so, uh, I, I didn't want to give up on interior design, but as I said, I did it about 10 years and I got to the point where I thought, I, I'm going to have to quit because I just don't know what else to do. You know, you couldn't want to please your customers more than I did. And I had nice customers, but I drove them crazy or they drove me crazy. I don't know. So I really, when I hired this business mentor, it was really a last ditch effort. And I thought, I'm going to give this a few months and see what happens. And 
really what happened was she she pushed me to consider the possibility that if I would start over, if I would, in other words, throw out everything I thought I knew about business and rebuild my business with a new goal, that it was possible, maybe, just maybe, uh, I could create something that was uh, worthwhile and would provide clients with an experience beyond what they're getting from most uh, customers or from most interior design professionals. And if you're going to tell someone else, you know, this is where you need to start when you rebuild your business like that, where are they starting at? Well, you have to determine a reasonable hourly fee and you have to you have to start developing systems because I thought I've really fought on the systems thing. I thought, no, 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 I'm creative. Every job is different, every budget is different, every client is different. I don't want to deal with systems. And then I realized uh, you know, after hitting my head on against the wall too one too many times that systems would actually allow me to be more creative because they would manage the day to day minutia of running the business business in a way that I would never be able to manage without them and then I would be caught up in all those tasks that are so time-consuming without a guidebook and I could go out into the world and do what I'm good at uh, and then take those choices and run them through the system and they would run through the system just like a Starbucks so I get the same you know outcome every single time so you know it's it was to the point where I didn't even know if I wanted people who knew me to hire me because what if it ended badly and today I work I can work for friends I can work for family and I charge them exactly what I charge people I don't know and it works really well so um, I don't know it's well I, and have, have you found that there's sort of a lack of confidence of, of raising rates because maybe people feel that oh, I'm gonna lose out on business they're gonna go to someone else absolutely and I always tell them this story of years ago there was a bad movie of the week and it was about Martha Stewart who's like you know an icon in the world of design of course she's wonderful and it was starring Sybil Shepherd and there was a scene where Martha had made these pies and she was selling them in a Connecticut strip mall and all day long Martha's just sitting there trying to sell her pies and she's a big sign that says pies five dollars and nobody's buying her pies and they show time-lapse photography the day passes nobody buys a pie and of course we know she's Martha Stewart but nobody knew her then mm. so she rips up her sign in frustration and I think and a lot of people think oh she's gonna write pies two for one or <laughs> two for five dollars no she writes pies twenty dollars and then they show a little lineup begins and people are curious I wonder what a twenty dollar pie is like they're thinking to themselves and they started buying her pies and I thought that's that is the powerful <laughs> bad movie of the week became kind of a call to arms for me. I realized like every time you lower your rate, you're, you're not increasing a desire for what you have to offer. You're actually just saying you're not that good. You're really not that good. <laughs> so they should probably hire somebody else. Everybody would prefer, you know, and this is, you know, 15 years ago. So a $20 pie was a thing that was unheard of, I guess. So uh, that's what I try to tell them. And often when business slows down, the first line of defense is I'll just cut my fees. Really at a time when you're going to have fewer customers, you're going to cut your fees and make even less money. And not only that, but you know, we all know that the good clients are, are paying for services. Really great clients will pay because they, they truly value the work that we do. And somebody who wants it done in you know, 20 hours and for half the price is, is not a customer you want, really. It's really not. What do you tell designers about about developing more work, whether it's you know the people who you're working with and in your community? Well, I can tell you the number one way to get work is to finish the job you're doing and make them happy and make sure that they refer you to somebody. Uh, you got to get published. Uh, I think I think the publishing uh, can help a lot and you know we just recently had a big spread in house and home magazine which was awesome and it doesn't mean the phone begins to ring off the hook that week it really doesn't uh, but two years later somebody will say I remember I saw that spread in house and home and now I'm finally calling you and so you just want to always make sure you're doing these you know getting these publishing gigs as you and go what, along. What's the secret to getting published Kimberly? You know, the, the secret is don't give up because I was the decorating editor of Style at Home magazine for 18 years and it was amazing to me. We would get a project by email and I would never hear from them again. And we got, we were so busy. We got projects all the time. We just didn't have time to go through them all. That's one thing. The second thing is people will often pitch 
uh, a story to a magazine that it's not right for. So for example, at Style at Home magazine, we didn't do before and afters. I would say 50% of the pitches we got were before and afters. We don't do before and afters. So they're not paying attention to what the magazine looks like. Or Architectural Digest will, will photograph things at night, but nobody else does. So if you have a night shoot, it may look artsy, but it's not going into El Decor, let's say. So I think it's know the publication. And then the best, the best trick I could say for getting into a magazine is hire a photographer who does a lot of work for that magazine because the photographer will have the ear of the editors and when they're stuck looking for a, a ranch house uh, they, they're looking for a bungalow or a ranch house the photographer will say oh I just saw, shot something with this architect in Fresno and it might be perfect for you so um, spend the money on good quality photography and look for the photographers who the magazines use that's really the very best tip there is. Excellent. Kimberly, uh, going back to your bio here, there's there's a number of businesses that you have your fingers in and a number of commitments, <laughs> right? So, and, and it, you know, what is, you, you talked about systems earlier, about the idea that systems help us run a better business. What would you say is the key to being able to uh, juggle your various interests? You know, I'm just going to mention for our listeners again that you do have a design build into your design build studio with two offices. Uh, you are the editor-in-chief for Dabble Magazine, as well as being the host of a number of uh, TV series. <laughs> well, I, I, it sounds silly, but really, um, I was not able to keep staff. Uh, and I certainly wasn't able to have staff who were satisfied until I had systems, because without that, they never knew how to make the boss happy. They never knew wh when they hit the target. Uh, they were always coming close to the target, but not quite there. Um, a shifting set of criterion for success is no way to run a business. So I found once we started getting systems, it could be everything from how you answer the phone to uh, we have a policy, for example, that every email is returned within 24 hours of a business day. And that does not mean we have uh, an answer. It means that we, we uh, acknowledge that we have received the email and the question you're asking us is going to take a few days to answer, but we've received it. Because one of the complaints I always heard from clients is they never knew when the designer or, or uh, you know, renovator or whatever was going to get back to them. I never knew if they were going to call me on Tuesday or Friday or on the weekend or whatever. So we thought, no, we can we can solve that problem. You know, we can just have a very strict, you get back to them the same day and let them know by when they'll have an answer. So I think for me, um, having systems, you know, very strict policies around how things work makes it really easy to come and help me. You know, I can hire temporary help because they say, here's how we answer the phone. This is the goal. Here's how you sign them up or whatever, whatever it is. Excellent. And so then it sounds like what you're saying is that the systems themselves are what help you to be able to manage these businesses as a business, oh my gosh. as yeah. opposed to a hobby or, or yeah. something that's has a lot of tentacles. Well, that's it. And I, I, I wonder about architects because most interior design professionals work for themselves. The vast majority work for themselves. Um, so I think that there's this idea that you're all alone and you're sort of wedged between the client and the suppliers and you never have a safe spot to land. Uh, and there's this idea that you're just little old you. And in fact, um, even if you work by yourself, I always tell people, I think of my contract as my partner because my contract has all the rules for working with, with me. It has all my corporate policies. And so when a client says, for example, oh, you know, we don't, we don't like retainers. You know, we trust people and we're really nice and we're going to pay our bills on time. Um, the nice me, little old me who works by myself might go, oh, okay, you seem nice. That's all right. We'll just skip the retainer this time. But instead I look to my contract and I go, mm, my contract says, no, absolutely not. Must have a retainer or we can't start. <laughs> Um, so I think you don't, even if you work by yourself, you've got to get to a place where you're not by yourself. And so something like uh, the business of architecture, business of design are terrific um, allies, you know, so that you're not alone. Absolutely. And just on that note, I would like to encourage all of our listeners, go check out Business of Design because um, Ms. Selden is prepared. A, there's a lot of wonderful videos on there. There's, she actually has a, a conference that they run every year. Great, great resource. That and a lot you. of the lessons are equally applicable to architects. It's so fun. I know I was tooling around your site and I'm like, this is awesome. I can't wait to get to know all these people. <laughs> awesome.
Hey, Architect Nation, it is great to have you listening in today. I want to remind you that this episode of Business of Architecture is sponsored by BQE Software, the developers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice has been powering architecture firms for over 10 years and helping them to be more productive and profitable, which empowers architects to do what you like to do and what you got in this business for in the first place. Create great architecture and spaces. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Now back to our show. Kimberly, let's talk. So a couple weeks ago, I had an architect from Chicago on. Her name is uh, Catherine Darnstadt. And she was saying, you know what, as a woman in the profession, it's challenging, especially as an architect. And she gave a little anecdotal story about how she went to the building department in Chicago with her plans and she put them on the counter and uh, and she kind of said, hey, listen, we need to get these processed. And, and uh, the plan checker kind of looked at her and said, well, you know, I have a question, but I need to speak to the architect. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's yeah. horrifying in this age. And I think that's probably representative of a lot of, you know, perceptions that women get in the workplace, but also especially architects. So is there anything you can share? What's your what's been your personal experience as a woman, as a professional in just in the world in general, but then also as a designer? Well, it's interesting. Your your um, body of architects is made up of 80 percent men, where our body of designers is 80 percent women. So together we're perfect. Which is great. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> um, but we, we what we deal with a lot um, in a similar way is just a, they patronize, you know, oh, you're just going to pick color. Well, no, actually, uh, you know, we need the toilet. Uh, we were on a job, for example, where the client had a, a child who had a very serious disability and was in a wheelchair. And so we made some changes uh, uh, based on barrier free and we had to deal with the contractor constantly saying, I don't need your help with that stuff. I just need you to pick the pillows, but he was about to put the toilet in the wrong place. Um, and so we have to just constantly come in and defend ourselves and defend our expertise. Um, it's a little bit better as you get older. I have uh, young junior designers who start working with me and they really struggle to get the trades and the, and the uh, contractors uh, on board and part of their team. Um, you know, I, maybe that's the case of any profession, you know, in fact. Do you have any words of, of advice for young women who are emerging in the profession to get over that? You just mentioned there's a little bit of a struggle at the beginning to kind of establish yourself with some of the trades. These are male-dominated industries a lot of times. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you, when I was when I first launched into the business and I was so young and um, I, was, I always thought I had to know everything. And uh, I probably didn't ask for help as often as I should. And, and now I know there's absolutely nothing wrong with, I don't have to know everything. I'm not a, an electrician. Uh, if a client asks me a question about electrical, I don't, I don't have to know. I don't even want to know. But I know who to ask. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, there might be a little bit of that where you just have to put yourself out there and let them know that you maybe don't know everything, but you're really good at this one part of the project and that's the part you're going to manage and you could use their assistance and you could use their help. And then I think you do have to just hold your ground in a way almost, you know, you just have to step up and hold your ground. And again, it goes back, you have got to be good at business because in my experience, there's finger, it's an industry of finger pointing, you know, it's his fault, her fault, their fault. She told me, they told me. So we're really good at just making sure every face-to-face uh, -face discussion is followed up with an email. Here's what was said. Here's what we'd agreed uh, so that we always have a paper trail uh, to follow the, the decision-making process for the clients and for the contractors. <laughs> Uh, paper trail never hurts, right? Yeah, exactly. Kimberly, what's been your biggest business f failure that you've experienced and how did you overcome it? Well, I just, I guess disappointing clients is very painful. Um, and very often clients are nice. You know, they don't say, I hate you, get out. I wish you were dead. They say things like, oh, we love everything you've done and we're just going to finish it ourselves. I kind of jokingly refer to that as Canadian fired. Um, <laughs> Canadian fired is we really love you, but we're just going to stop now and we'll just finish it ourselves. That's Canadian fired. Um, I, I'd say that was a really big challenge. And then just getting over this idea that I'm not good at business or business is not something I want to do. I didn't realize how much fun business could be. 
uh, until somebody explained to me how it worked and what my profit and loss statement looked like and how I could track that on a monthly basis and see how I was doing. All that kind of stuff seemed onerous and frightening to me, but in fact, it's really it's kind of fun and lovely, and it's an opportunity um, to sit at your desk for a day, and often designers, you know, are out on a job site or we're in a store sourcing or whatever. So I now have, I'm at the point where I quite like the business side of things, but it, it definitely took a little uh, encouragement. Yeah. Were there any inflection points? I think that, you know, Malcolm Gladwell talks about the tipping point, the point where something just really takes off. If you look back at your business, were there any points where you did something, you implemented something, and you just experienced this really incremental growth instead of this steady plod? Yeah. There was there was a there was a big one and I I'll never forget it. Um, we as I said when I when I first started we used to do the floor plan and then we come back later and show them the elevations and we come back later and show them the sofas and the drapes and this you know this process went on for weeks and weeks and weeks, and part of my mission to deliver on time on budget was to stop that back and forth process that clients don't like, and to be able to give them a guaranteed budget I had to know the scope of work and I had to know the entire scope of work, so. Our first five steps are about developing the scope of work, making every design decision there is, getting prices on everything, and then presenting everything to the client at once. And I remember the first time I did it, I was terrified because I thought, first of all, I thought when the client sees that it's going to cost $300,000 to do her house, she's going to throw me out of her house. So uh, my knees were knocking. I was terrified, but we did the presentation. It was very organized. It was very orderly. Everything was there. And she said, is there going to be any more money you need for me? And I said, never going to ask you for another penny. And she said, let me get my checkbook. And when she left the room, I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> because I used to be asking for money all the time okay now can I order this now can I order that one and you begin a negotiation over you know a hundred times during the course of the project where you're going yes I need 72 more dollars because blah 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 and I thought I didn't like it and I know the clients hated it so for me going to that turnkey presentation system uh, dramatically improved how much I like my job dramatically improved how much the clients like working with me and and dramatically increased the bottom line for sure I'm gonna dig into that a little bit Kimberly I, <laughs> I mean I know how difficult that is to have a fixed scope because yeah. a lot of times it's it's difficult especially if you don't have the experience to know what's what's gonna happen and what's yeah. gonna how that's going to work. Do you have any 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 tips or pointers for being able to firm that up and having that turn that turnkey presentation? Well, we begin to develop the scope of work at step one, and then for us, we have step three is uh, what we call trade day. So we get every single trade we need to do every single task on the job in the house on the same day, and we sort of stagger their appointments at a half hour increments. And then it's a discipline, it's a muscle you have to work because I know uh, if the living room has to be done, I have to deal with the draperies and maybe the hardwood floor and maybe the electrical's got to move, maybe there's a popcorn ceiling and that needs to come out and so I need somebody to come in and dispose of all that stuff. Uh, it's just a matter of slowing down and I think um, having the discipline to make every single decision up front. It's hard when you're used to thinking, I'll do that later. Mm. I'll do that later. So, um, you know, I would love to be able to work with architects when they finish the overall structure of the house for us to say, now here's the layer that's going to be furniture and drapes and all that kind of stuff. And here's where the TV goes and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Uh, and then be able to present to the client all at once. Imagine how great it is because a beautiful home, architecturally speaking, is not complete. Um, and a beautiful home from a design point of view is not complete. They have to work together. And I think clients do better. Um, I think they can handle sticker shock, just like when they go buy a car. But what they don't like is being asked for money 28 times. Yeah. So it sounds like there's a lot of psychology from from Mars from the designer's perspective also to a lot of times it's a mind game. Well, yeah, and it it's more than that because I don't want to be asked for money twenty eight times. You know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to go to a store to buy shoes and find out that they sold me the the shoe but not the heel. <laughs> so I gotta come back to get the heel and then I gotta come back to get the bow that's on the shoe. I'm I just wanna buy the shoe. Like how much for the damn shoe? And the shoe might be expensive. 
Um, and I can I can make a decision. I want that shoe. That's what it costs. And I find clients just don't negotiate the same way when you present everything at once. They see their house and they're like, oh my God, this is actually going to get done. And at that point, I tell them, all you have to do is write a check. Done. All you have to do is write a check. And uh, most of them, when they hire you, they're serious. They, they have a project that they want done. And you know what? The fact of the matter is our industry has a very bad reputation. You ask anybody on the street if they hire any any one of us, an architect, designer, contractor, um, and they give you a budget if it's accurate. Mm. Every single person you meet will say, no, they wanted more, they wanted more, they wanted more. And that, that just, I just didn't want to be part of that anymore. Mm. Well, right now, Kimberly, I know you're in, a, you're in the middle of a book launch. Yeah. Can you tell us about your book? I have two books, uh, Business of Design uh, Part 1 and Part 2, very imaginatively titled. <laughs> uh, but the idea was the first the first book is all about what to charge and how to collect. Um, it also has a contract that I use with my trades. So I actually have my trades sign a contract with me because I found that often we were chasing the trades. You know, we need an electrician to give us a quote and we were chasing him for three weeks after he'd been to the house to give us the quote. So I worked with my trades to create a contract that was fair to them but fair to us and it's a contract that we blow up when we're on the job site so the client can see the rules of engagement they can see what's expected uh, during the project um, and it's got simple things in there uh, for example for trades we tell them that you might be at mrs. Smith's house but I'm the client I'm the person you have to make happy. I'm the person you take direction to. You can't take any direction from Mrs. Smith. And, um, you know, they're not used to that. The trades aren't used to that. They're used to getting a job from a decorator or designer and then getting to be friendly with the homeowner and saying, hey, we should add, you know, on the mudroom or whatever. Um, and we want to make sure that we're on top of all those conversations because we know how much money the clients are putting out for the areas we're working already and that's going to be outside their budget and we don't want it to impact what's coming down the road, etc. Um, so that's book number one and then about four years later, I guess, book number two uh, came along and it's our 15 step process. So it's all the systems we use from the first step to the last to run the project. And it's written uh, like I talk. It's very easy to read and it's very prescriptive. I don't like theory. I go to too many conferences where it's all blah, blah, blah theory and that just doesn't work for me. Tell me exactly what you do and I'll try it and if it works, great. Uh, but please don't tell me that communication is key to your success because I don't know what that means. <laughs> well, I'm sure that our, our, our clever and smart listeners will head over and pick these books up as soon as they can. Awesome. Tell me where they would go to find them. Uh, they can go to businessofdesign.com. That's where we prefer everybody goes. If they go to Amazon, they're going to pay uh, shipping and uh, ta uh, shipping and delivery charges. Uh, and if they come through us, they, they won't have to pay that. Um, and there ought to be a business of architecture book that we can have as a companion uh, and figure out a way to get our two communities to work more harmoniously together. I think that would be great. Well agreed, well agreed. And I did want to tell of our listeners that... Um, the community over business of design is very inclusive. You'll find that there are architects that participate in the events that Kimberly Seldon and Business of Design puts on. They have a bunch of CEU courses that um, that you can learn about how to run a great design business. And I've looked at them. They're very high quality. Kimberly, tell me a little bit about the resources that you have for any architects that may want to check out the business resources that you have on business of design. Well, it's funny, you know, I never thought architects would um, pop over to businessofdesign.com. I had them on a pedestal and I thought, oh, they're so lucky because clients just do whatever they tell them and they never have to argue about oh, fees. Yes, and yes. <laughs> but I really did, I really did have that thought. And I was surprised when I started meeting architects who said, oh, no, we're constantly getting our fees negotiated and they want a flat fee before we even know what the scope of work is. And they want it to be $100,000 but it's $300,000 worth of material. Um, so a, a lot of our issues are exactly the same. Uh, and certainly for architects who also step into decorating, you know, obviously any of the courses are really valuable, but we, we do have some really terrific architects and I've made an effort to connect them with other people, uh, uh, designers and say, you know, work together. If you, if you need an architect, work together. Because sometimes the decorator doesn't uh, know, know how to do AutoCAD. Mm -hmm. um, so, she, you know, she's, She's got to have somebody do those plans for her. Why not have a partnership with an architect 
firm uh, that could expand the business. You know, if they see that you're a decorator who's got an architect that you work with, they might decide to build a cottage and hire you again. You know, it's, it's absolutely it's a win That's, for everybody. That is something that we 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 talk about a lot, Kimberly. Is looking for allied professionals in terms of finding work and forming those relationships and partnerships. And frankly, I'm a little shocked that you haven't been approached by some high caliber architects that want to collaborate with you. I know. We are too, actually. It's so funny. We, we always think it's going to work out, but it kind of doesn't. So <laughs> but anyway, we're still open to it. We'll see what happens. Maybe you'll be the push we needed. <laughs> All right, Kimberly Seldon, thank you for joining us on the business of architecture. Oh, it was awesome to be here. You keep up the great work, and I hope to be at one of your events in the near future. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. Views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.